Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Incredible Email Hacks You'd Never Expect and How You Can Stop Them. This event is brought to you in partnership with our friends, by our friends at Know Before. Thanks so much for joining us on the webinar today. We've got an amazing presentation lined up for you. Before we get started, there's just a few things that you should know about today's event. Uh, first off, I should mention my name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'll be serving as the moderator. Uh, as always, we want these events to be educational. Uh, security is a hot topic. Uh, these malicious attacks happening every day are affecting all of us, and we need to do what, whatever we can to better protect ourselves. And so we want to help to solve your security challenges and answer all your questions on today's event we encourage you to use the questions tab there in your audience console many of you have already said hello and good afternoon and we appreciate that we also want your technical questions so keep them coming i also want to call your attention there to the handouts tab you'll find a number of resources but the most important one i want to call your attention to is the link to get started with know before it's right there on the top know before has some awesome resources out on their website uh, make sure that you check those out before you go. And then finally, at the end of today's webinar, I'll be announcing the winner of our Amazon $300 gift card door prize. If you're watching this on demand, of course, that drawing has already occurred. The prize terms can be found right there in your handouts tab. And then additionally, we also have our best question prize for an additional Amazon gift card, a $50 Amazon gift card. Uh, of course, you have to ask a question to be entered into that prize drawing and meet the actual tech media uh, prize terms and conditions as well. All right, so with our housekeeping information here out of the way, it's now time to bring in today's expert presenter. Welcome to Mr. Roger Grimes, data-driven defense evangelist at Know Before. Roger, I always learn just a ton of, of amazing tips and tricks and uh, so many things when you present. So it's great to have you back on, take it away. Glad to be here, David, and thanks everybody else for showing on up uh, from my talk. Incredible email hacks you'd never expect and how to stop them. If you haven't met me before, I've been doing computer security now for 34 years, earned all of those gray hairs. I've written 13 books and over 1,200 magazine articles now. Uh, and I was a professional penetration tester for 20 years, where every time I was hired to break into a company or an organization, I broke into in an hour or less. So even though they gave me you know, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks. Um, it wasn't that hard to break in. And I'm not really even that great of a hacker. I'm on a scale of one to 10, maybe I'm a five or a six. This is a, it's just that once you know how to hack, it's, it's like being a plumber or an electrician. It's not that hard to do. There are some of my books. Uh, the latest one is the Ransomware Protection Playbook. I work for Know Before. We're the world's largest integrated security awareness training and simulated phishing platform vendor. That means we try to help people not to be fished because phishing is a big way uh, that people get compromised. It's uh, phishing and social engineering is involved in 70 to 90% of all successful malicious data breaches today. Today, though, I want to talk about some incredible ways you you or your organization could be compromised by email. And it's going to be some, um, some of it's going to be popular stuff. A lot of it's going to be obscure stuff. But, uh, you know, I think anytime I've done this talk, there's at least one thing you haven't seen. Most people usually will come away going, I did not know that could be done. I hope to show you something unusual. And they're all real world attacks. Uh, most of them obscure, one or two of them really, really popular. Um, but even when I show you these kind of more obscure attacks, just know that regular social engineering and phishing is by far your biggest problem. The whole, hey, click this link, download this document, that's the stuff that's going to compromise most organizations and most people, but it can't hurt to be aware about some of the more advanced attacks. Here they are, and I'm just going to go right into covering uh, one of the first ones, um, which is password hash theft. I think most people in cybersecurity know that when you type in your password, like let's say your password's frog, that in most operating systems, it gets converted to what's called a cryptographic hash and stored that way. And there's some examples on the right-hand side of the screen of what a cryptographic hash might look like in a particular uh, hash algorithm. Uh, Landman and NT hashes are used in Windows. Uh, LM hashes, 
land man, land manager hash is used to be uh, used in Windows today, and it may still be used sometimes for backwards compatibility, but today it's the NT hash. Uh, Linux, Unix, Max used to use SHA-1 hash algorithms. But that got kind of declared bad a couple of years ago, so now most of them use SHA-2. And if you have a really good operating system, secure operating system like OpenBSD or something, it may use bcrypt by Bruce Schneier. Uh, but the whole idea is that when you type in your password of like frog or whatever, and hit enter, what the operating system stores either locally. Uh, so in Windows, it's stored in what's called the local security accounts manager, SAM database. If you're logging into an Active Directory network, that password hash would be stored on the domain controller that authenticated you in a file called ntds.dit. And that particular database is shared with all the all the domain controllers within the same domain. If you have Macs or Windows or Linux or BSD or whatever, the password hash could be stored in a file called passwd or shadow or something like that. But the idea is that they don't want to just store your plain text password, i.e. frog, uh, because if an attacker gets to it, they now have your plain text password and they can log in as you. So by use, by storing your password as the equivalent uh, cryptographic hash, uh, if the attacker gets to the hash, they may be able, especially in a Windows system, to reuse the hash. But it's not immediately, you can't take, you cannot take someone's hash and log in remotely on the web. You know, if you're trying to log in on the web to some console, it's not going to take the hash. So the idea was they can improve password security by never storing the password as the plain text password. But if an attacker can get your password hash, and typically it takes the attacker has to be a local administrator or domain administrator or, or uh, you know, root if you're on Linux or Mac or something like that. It takes some high level access to then run a hacker program that extracts those password hashes. But if they get them, they can actually upload them into a password hash cracking program on the screen. I have one called OptCrack. It's really not used a whole lot anymore. I just put it up there because it's a pretty gooey. Uh, usually what people use today is a program called Hashcat, which is far more popular. Uh, but if an attacker gets your hashes, they upload your hashes into that program. They also upload a password dictionary where all the words in the dictionary, password dictionary, have been pre-computed. The hashes have been pre-computed. And then the uh, password hash cracking program does a really fast comparison. And if it finds a match, it will say, oh, this is what your password it is kind of as in that example but you know in order for an attacker to do that password hash cracking comparison they have to have your hashes and again it usually took that they had to be in as administrator local administrator uh domain admin enterprise admin or root or something like that which means they kind of had to have god rights already to get them what's different today is i'm going to show you how sending you just a simple email uh, that you don't even do anything. You just open it and boom, your password hash is stolen by an attacker. Although let me say that's the rarer case. The far more common case is that I, I as an attacker have to uh, trick you into clicking on a link. Although we know from phishing tests and simulated phishing tests, it's not hard to convince people to click on a link. Uh, but if I can, what's new today to some people, most people probably attending this session, is that is simply opening an email or clicking on a link in an email can transmit your password hash to an attacker, and they then can start to do that password hash cracking. Uh, the way that it happens is that they ha the hacker uh, usually has to create a malicious web server on the internet. They create a URL link that hooks to an object on that fake web server on the internet. They send that link to the victim, usually in email, but it could be over the web or instant messaging or SMS messaging or something. When the victim clicks on the link, that URL attempts to download the object that that link references. And that web server, the hacker's web server says, I'm sorry, you must be authenticated to download this object. And then the uh, email client or browser will attempt to do, uh, especially on Windows systems, what's called Windows Integrated Authentication, but this works on Linux and Macs as well. It will attempt to do uh, Windows Integrated Authentication and it will do what's called an uh, NT challenge response connection to that web server. Uh, and from that NT challenge response, the attacker can derive what your password hash is and then start to crack it uh, using a password hash cracking tool like Hashcat. Uh, so again, to summarize this, uh, an attacker can send you a link that if you get tricked into clicking on, 
can send your password hash to the attacker that they then can crack. Um, there's di many different ways to do this attack. Uh, I'm getting ready to show you a Kevin Mitnick uh, video demo. Uh, in it, uh, Kevin is going to send himself, and he's both victim and attacker, but he's going to send himself an email. All he does is open it, although just know in real life, most of the time the victim would have to click on the link. Uh, his link is going to have what's called file colon forward slash forward slash forward slash in it. It's a trick. File colon forward slash forward slash forward slash usually tells a browser that the object that they're going to open up is locally on the person's computer or their local what's called NetBIOS network. But after that, Kevin's trick is he puts an HTTPS URL uh, link and the browser gets tricked into asking for that object over the internet. If you want to see more details about how this works and how you can defend yourself, you can go to the link here, download this slide deck and go to that link, an article I wrote a couple of years ago about this attack. Uh, but you can watch this Kevin Mitnick video. I think people that haven't seen this before and they're seeing it for the first time are usually surprised by how easy it is for an attacker to get your password hash and password. So let me let uh, Kevin's video do the talking for the next minute or so. This is the attacker system in the cloud, in the Amazon cloud in Virginia. And we have, I'm at, uh, logged into Outlook 365 here. I'm simply just going to click on the email. I just clicked. It takes a second for Office 365 to load. And here we go. We could see that the emails from Roger Grimes at NSA.gov, which is quite interesting. And there's nothing there. There's no hyperlink to click on. There's no attachment. But if we go over to the attacker system over here in the cloud, we were able to intercept or obtain Roger, well, the victim's NTLM v2 hash. So let's go ahead and try to do this. So we're going to go ahead and highlight this. We're going to copy it. We're going to go over to our password cracker over here. We're going to create a file. Here we go. We're going to paste in the hash. Very simple. And then what I'm going to do is just run a, a shell script that, um, that tries to crack the hash through a dictionary attack. And this is using a tool called local hashcat. And guess what? It's already cracked the hash. So if we scroll up here, we see there was a user named Kevin, right? And the password to the hash is Kevin123. So that's pretty wild if you've never seen it before. The, uh, the malicious web server Kevin used, he used a tool called Responder. Anybody can download it. It's open source, been around for a long time. Uh, anybody can go to GitHub and download and use that. And again, the way that Kevin does this trick is he creates a set of an HTTP link. It's actually what's called a UNC Universal Naming Convention Net BIOS link with file colon forward slash forward slash forward slash in it. Victim opens the email. To, in, in Kevin's video, they just open the video or they just open the email and it launched. But in most cases, they have to click the link. And, the, and Kevin's trick where they just open the email uh, that kind of takes like an unpatched zero day most of the time. And those do occur a couple of times a year. So there are times where simply opening the email, even in preview mode, may launch the attack. But just know 99.9% .9 of the time you have to convince the victim to click on the link. But again, not that hard. Uh, the uh, responder tool captures the NT challenge response handshake. From that, it generates the NT uh, password hash, and then he cracks that password hash. A lot of people ask me, well, will it work on my system? Will it work on my network? Will it work on, you know, Macs and Linux and all this other stuff with this browser, with Firefox, with Safari? I can only tell you that I've done this demo myself about a hundred times in many different companies, and it always works. But, you know, I don't want to say that it's going to work in your company because I don't know what your environmental variables are, but just know that you can, following these steps on your screen, recreate the same demo that Kevin just demoed in, in an hour or less. You have to know a little bit of Linux, but you download Kali Linux and then you turn on Responder and create this HTTP link or the, or the file column forward slash forward slash address. So uh, if you don't know Linux, you can you know get meet a friend or have a friend that knows a little bit of Linux, but you can follow these 11 steps and be up and running. Uh, in no time. So just, uh, you know, give that a shot. 
uh, and you can find out if it works in your environment. I've never met an environment it didn't work in. Uh, years and years ago, I probably started first talking about this attack probably three or four years ago. It was a real attack, but it wasn't used a whole lot. Since then, uh, I see news stories a couple times a year where people, attackers, are using this sort of attack. Here's one news story. Uh, where a newly discovered watering hole attack targets Ukrainian and Canadian organizations. And you can see if you were to read that description there, you know, it just talks about it's obtained the exact same way uh, that you just saw. And there's even uh, in, in the U.S., the San Francisco airport. I think all of us, when we go to an airport, like to take advantage of the airport's free Wi-Fi. Well, San Francisco's free Wi-Fi airport logon screen had been compromised by some attackers, and they put in this exact attack with the file colon forward slash forward slash. Interesting in the article, they only put two forward slashes, but it takes four forward slashes, uh, and was able to capture people's login names and passwords for a long, long time. So these are not, you know, this is, I don't want to say rare, but it probably is close to rare. They're not common. They're uncommon attacks. But, you know, some people ask, is it true that somebody can send me an email and all I do is click on the link and it could possibly compromise me? Yeah. And this is one of the ways. Uh, defenses, well, if you look at the very bottom here, if you have a Windows machine, Microsoft actually has a patch against this, uh, but it's an optional patch because it's not a very common attack and, it, and you have to do some registry configuration to tell Windows what the local networks are, uh, but you can download a patch. Although I've never seen, it's optional, and I've never seen this patch applied on any organization I've ever been in. Uh, but also you can block the ports that allow these sort of attacks to happen. I have a list there. This particular demo attack uh, used the NetBIOS ports, which are UDP 137, 138, TCP 139, and 445, and LN and MR. Uh, but there's other ports that could be used for that. Well, these ports rarely, if ever, should be allowed from a regular PC or laptop out onto the Internet. So you could use a firewall to block these ports. You could also filter inbound file colon forward slash forward slash forward slash links. If you see some type of email coming to you or link that has four forward slashes in front of file colon, it's probably bad and it would be easy to filter it out. Uh, next attack, uh, this is called clickjacking. Um, clickjacking has been a problem for decades, and it happens uh, when you're in a browser and you go to a website, but really there's some malicious code on this website. And what it does is when you're getting ready to click on something that you think is legitimate, right at the last second, uh, this malicious JavaScript can switch and have you click or approve something you didn't mean to. It's called uh, clickjacking. They're hijacking your mouse click to click on something you didn't intend. And this has been around for decades, three decades, uh, or maybe not quite three, but more than two decades. And browser man all the major browser manufacturers try their best to stop clickjacking because it, it was quite a problem for a whole lot of years. They didn't want rogue JavaScript taking away what's called the locus or focus of control and click jacking. Uh, but what we've seen a couple of years ago, especially this is a problem for touch screens, is that people get an email or go to a website that would have a fake eyelash or piece of dust. And the person with the touch screen would go to hit that the, to wipe away that hair or that dust, and boom, you know what they just did? Possibly sent their password hash. <laughs> uh, in reality, we've not seen the, this trick used to send somebody's password hash. We've only seen it uh, used to make spam show up, trying to sell fake Viagra or something. But just know, you know, if you got a touch screen, there could be this, you know, hair eyelash or dust that really isn't hair eyelash or dust so what do you do just educate people with touch screens to you know realize that dust or hair may not be dust or hair uh those last two attacks are pretty uncommon this attack is the opposite it is super super common it's known as password spray attacks or credential stuffing traditional password guessing attacks would be an attacker trying to guess your password or my password. What they do is they get your login name. They try to find a place where you might log on in. And then they try to guess as many passwords as they can, hoping that you don't have account lockout enabled. And they just guess, you know, hundreds of thousands of times until they have the right password. Well, most companies have enabled account lockout, meaning that you can only guess a certain amount of times at the incorrect password before the account gets locked out. So password spray attacks came into vogue uh, probably starting about 10 years ago, and they're very popular today. 
But what they do is they get all the login names or as many as they can for everybody in the company. And then they, they guess a smaller number of passwords that they think are likely to be used at least by one person within the company. We call it a wide, low and slow attack. And they don't guess any faster uh, than they don't want to cause the account lockout to happen. So usually they'll take one of the accounts and try to see if they can make the account lock out by doing a bunch of bad guesses. And they go, oh, okay, it locks out after, you know, excuse me, say six guesses. Then they'll use another couple of accounts to find out, well, how long is the account locked out for before the bad password uh, account is reset? Is it 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, a day, a week? What is it? But essentially using a couple sacrificial user accounts, they'll find out what the company's account lockout policy is. And then they'll fire off uh, telling a password spraying program to guess uh, you know, 100, 1,000, 10,000 passwords, but never any faster across all of these accounts than would uh, lock out any of the accounts. And just know you can't lock out the true Windows administrator account. Uh, Acme, which is a large company in the internet that does load balancing in different servers for large companies like Google and Microsoft, said they saw 61 billion credential stuffing attacks in a year and a half. So unlike the first two attacks I showed you, this is really, really popular. 61 billion, one company saw 61 billion credential stuffing attacks in just 18 months. So very, very popular. Uh, it's been used to break into all sorts of companies. Microsoft and Google said it's among the most successful types of attacks against companies. Like here's an example news article uh, from 2019 where the hackers broke into Cisco. Uh, using password screen, uh, spraying attacks. But Microsoft said using social engineering and a, co a combination of social engineering and password uh, spray attacks, the uh, one out of every like 220 of their multi-billion user accounts that they have, customers, uh, one out of every 220 of them are compromised every month uh, using some type of password attack, including password spray attacks. Um, so how does it work? Well, first the hacker has to collect a bunch of login names, which is usually just email addresses, but they have to find them. Uh, usually they're using what's called open source intelligence tools. There's a bunch, there's hundreds of these tools out there. Here's one called fingerprinting organizations, the collective archives or FOCA. To be honest, hackers don't usually use this tool. Uh, it's too cumbersome. I'll show you in a minute what hackers like to use. I just had this one here because it's a pretty gooey. And I think it's a good one to run for your company. Uh, and what FOCA is, it's just a front end that runs two or three search engines, Google and Bing. And it may or may not run DuckDuckGo as the third one. You have to enable the third one. But you put in your company's domain name, like knowbefore.com, hit enter, and it will use those two or three search engines to find everything it can on the internet about that company. And one of the fields is login names or email addresses. And so that would be used to collect that information, maybe even come up with a, a couple of login portals where they could use those, you know, attempt to log in from. The tool that hackers mostly use is called Recon NG. Uh, this is a Linux tool. Anybody can download it. And uh, again, what you do is you put in the domain name like knowbefore.com and hit enter and it will go find information for you. One of the things it has is what's called leak dump. Uh, or, or, or things like that. There exist on the internet tens of billions of login names and passwords. Many of those passwords have expired, but the login names are still good. And many times the passwords are still good. An attacker can actually use Recon NG, put in uh, you know the domain name like knowbefore.com of their target, and then use you know one of these 81 reconnaissance modules like uh, Leak you know, like leak dump and leak lookup. So they can actually type in and find out, is there, you know, does this company's uh, login names and credentials exist in one of those many tens of billions of password dump files and be able to look that up and get that information back there. And again, the attacker is not even so interested in knowing if the, pa the actual passwords are accurate today. They just are trying to get the login names for this particular type of attack. Sometimes they use another tool called Harvester that would help uh, find uh, places where they could log in. It will bring back, you know, gather email addresses, subdomains, host names, employee names, open ports, banners, so they can find email servers, VPN servers, things like that. Uh, it, you know, and let me say this: I, I think every company 
should run these open source intelligence tools on against their own company to find out what's out there on the internet. If you're interested in seeing a bunch of different cool open source intelligence tools, you can go to Awesome OSINT on GitHub and download some programs. Again, I, I think it's a good idea for defenders to run this against their company because you don't want the defend, you know, you don't want hackers being the only people that are finding out what information about your company is out there on the internet. And if you find information that maybe your company doesn't want out there, you may be able to try to get that information deleted. There's even, you know, commercial services and companies like Delete Me and stuff that will do it on your behalf. Uh, but, you know, it's, of course, real tough to get rid of information that's on the Internet. But at least, you know, you can go see what's out there. And if you see a lot of, you know, login names and passwords and things like that, you can make sure those passwords are changed. Uh, but the attacker is ultimately trying to find ultimately trying to find an online portal uh, for your company they can guess against. You know, they, they like to guess against, you know, uh, email uh, logins. You know, if you have Office 365 or Google or maybe Cisco VPN or something, uh, they do a lot of what's called Google hacks, we would call them, where you can just search on particular things. Like just as an example, when I was thinking about how would I find login portals, uh, I used to work for Microsoft for 11, 12 years. And I said, oh, you know, I know a common login portal that usually isn't well protected. They don't usually require MFA. It's usually kind of a neglected portal. They don't usually do account lockout. They don't normally monitor it really well. And that's Active Directory Federated Services. Well, if someone has Active Directory Federated Services, more than likely the URL of that link is going to have ADFS forward slash LS in it. And so I said, oh, let me let me do a search for ADFS LS sign in that will find me what I know is Active Directory Federated Services login portals. And I ran this. That's a real Google, you know, uh, input that I put in there and I came back with Tesla and uh, here's a Tesla ADFS portal. Now, what's interesting is Tesla uh, requires multi-factor authentication for their employees or contractors to log on in, but their ADFS portal doesn't. Uh, so that's what hackers are looking for. These kind of inadvertent login portals that aren't as well protected, maybe don't even have account lockout enabled on them. A lot of times they're looking for application programming interfaces. Uh, not every company has this, but a lot of companies have this. Our company has this, but there are these, you know, connection points, URLs that allow uh, one company's computer system to query or connect. Uh, to another company's computer system to do, you know, a lot of different commands. Well, Acme said that 75% of those spray attacks, password spray attacks, remember they said they saw 61 billion password spray attacks in a year and a half. Well, 75% of them were against APIs. And, and why? Because APIs almost never allow multi-factor authentication. They're usually weakly monitored. They usually don't have account lockout enabled and stuff like that. So attackers look for them. They're always looking for those weird portals that, you know, IT is not protecting quite as well. Uh, then the attackers have to have a password dictionary that they're using. They know, though, the stats are that 75% of organizations will have people uh, with passwords on a list of just 1,000 random passwords. 87% of organizations will have people with passwords on a list of 10,000 passwords. And they can guess. If they're only allowed to guess, you know, six times every 15 minutes, they still can work through thousands of passwords, you know, in three months, six months or a year. And they, again, hackers are quite often doing this and you can down, they can download and get password dictionaries all over the internet. My favorite password dictionary here is algae, <laughs> a list. Of, it's a password dictionary made of algae. That sounds like a weird password list dictionary to get. But, uh, you know, one time I was doing a password, uh, I was trying to break into a company and I knew that the administrator loved Star Trek. So I used Star Trek words and Klingon dictionary and was able to break all of his passwords uh, like in 15 minutes. He had used the Klingon language. Uh, so sometimes if you know a little bit about your target, that can help you. But they upload that and then you have to have a password spray tool. The most common one today is probably what's called spray shell script. It's just a Linux shell script. Uh, and you put in like the type of login, whether it's HTTPS or OWA or Cisco or something like that. The targets, the target server's IP address or domain name, where the login screen will be. Then the file name of the user uh, names that you're going to try or email addresses, the file name of the password dictionary you're going to use. The attempts per lockout period, how long uh, the lockout period is in minutes that they have to wait in between the you know possible number of guesses. And optionally, if you know the domain, you can put that in there. Anybody can download this from GitHub, the shell, the uh, shell spray script. 
Um, anybody can get it and download and use it. Here's where I just did a test of it in the lab where I said, you know, spray shell script, do dash Cisco for a Cisco VPN. Uh, here's the login screen of that VPN, uh, which I was at victim.com. Uh, and there's the user list, password list. And I said, you can guess 20 times every 1,440 seconds, which I, I think that's in an hour. Uh, but it tells you, it shows you there that in the lab, I was able to compromise, you know, two passwords. Somebody was reusing uh, me and my friend Eric were reusing the word password as a password. And you think that's crazy. But uh, after 30 years of password education, the most common password is still password. Um, and there's different tools you can use. Here's some other examples, Brutus and Web Brood and Canon Able. And the bottom right hand one is uh, H H or THC Hydra. That actually is, the other three are kind of older and not used anymore, but THC Hydra is used still a lot. It's a, probably second most popular one I see in these password spraying attacks after um, after the, the, the previous tool that I was showing you, uh, a spray shell script. Uh, but then they guess, and here's some pictures. I, I, I actually got off the internet from other hackers that were bragging uh, about different companies they compromised. And I, But you can see here, like on the left-hand side, any of the uh, 4371, so those are successful password guesses. And on the right-hand side, uh, you can see where this attacker guessed the, the password of princess. And what's interesting is most companies you know, have password policies that say, oh, you got to have long, complex passwords. But I guarantee in every company I've ever been in, for some reason, there's multiple accounts that just were not required to use these new, fancy, long, complex passwords. You know, it's the interface accounts, sometimes admin accounts or whatever. But, you know, even if you require them to use long and complex passwords, in most companies, that means like an eight character password with an uppercase first character followed by a lowercase vowel with a number one or two at the end. They're not really that complex and not that hard to guess as you might think. Uh, so what are your defenses against password spray attacks? You know, required passwords with strong entropy. They should be long and complex. Use MFA if you can. MFA can be fished around in most cases, but it does, you know, they can't steal your password if you don't have a password. Uh, you know, make sure you protect your online portals with VPNs or MFA. Rename your Windows administrator account because it can never be locked out or disable it even better. You know, um, enable account lockout, enable monitoring to detect password spray attacks. A lot of companies have security event monitoring that could detect password spray attacks, but they just don't have it enabled. They don't look for, because you really have to look for an unusually high number of, of bad login uh, accounts. That's the way you detect this attack. You know, normally, let's say your company, you know, company-wide, you have 100 or 500 bad password logins every day, and one day you get 50,000. Well, that's something maybe you should investigate. And make sure you enable account lockout and monitoring on your APIs as well, since Acme said that's where 75% of password spray attacks were done. Here's another attack. Uh, a lot of accounts, whether it's protected by passwords or MFA, can be recovered using different methods like SMS or password reset questions or alternate email addresses. While these recovery methods are usually easier to hack or easier to use for a hacker to use than the actual, you know, trying to break the password or disable the MFA. Uh, and so hackers will oftentimes attack these recovery uh, consoles or password reset consoles. Uh, the weakest type of recovery method uh, that's easy for hackers to hack are these password reset questions. Uh, you know, what's your mother's maiden name? What's your favorite car? Or my, the funniest one that I see all the time is what's your favorite vet? Well, whatever your password is, you know, it might be a million different things your password is. You know, what your favorite car is at most is 100 guesses because there's only like 100 different car brands at any one time. They don't change that much year to year. And, you know, everybody's favorite car is probably closer to like a Lamborghini or a Mustang or, you know, Lexus is probably not a Ford Escort, right? I mean, so if you give me, I bet I could guess most people's favorite car within 10 to 20 guesses. You know, what's your favorite veterinarian? Well, you know, it's probably a veterinarian within, you know, 10, 15 miles of the person. Uh, your mother's maiden name. Is there anybody that can't look that up? I mean, these password reset questions are just absolutely horrible. Lots of people can guess at them. Google actually did a white paper years ago called Secret Lies and Account Recovery, Lessons from the Use of Personal Knowledge Questions at Google. And what they found is that 20% of some recovery questions can be guessed on the first try by a hacker, one out of five. 
16% of the answers could be found in a person's social media profile, and 40% of people are unable to recall their own recovery answers, which I don't know what that means other than, well, if you call a hacker, it looks like they only have, you know, they have half, <laughs> half as much chance of you. They might get 20% of the time, they may be able to guess it on the first guess. Uh, and these sort of password reset questions have been used to take over people's uh, email accounts for years. The most famous instance was probably Sarah Palin when she was running for vice president uh, with um, John McCain years ago against uh, Biden and Obama. Uh, some Democratic operative's kid uh, got into her her Yahoo account. He said there was like three questions. It took him like an hour to look up the answers. One of the questions was, where did you meet your husband? And it was well known that she'd met Todd Palin in high school. What's your favorite sport? He said basketball because she was on the basketball uh, high school state basketball championship team in Alaska. And the other one was, what's your zip code? Well, there's only two zip codes in Wasilla, Alaska. So he was able to compromise her, uh, reset her password, compromise her account. Unfortunately for him, he then bragged about it all over the internet in 4chan or 8chan. He was arrested and put in jail as he should have been. Uh, but what's your you know, defenses against that? Never answer these questions with the real answers. It's crazy. This is not Jeopardy. When they say, what's your mother's maiden name? Pizza, pizza. What's your you know, father's you know, brother's name, but what's your favorite friend or whatever? Don't put in a real answer. Treat each of these as if they're kind of passwords. Uh, I never answer these questions with the real answers, anything close to it. Uh, what I do is I write down, sadly, for each website that has these that you have to put these questions in, I have to put in both the question and the answer. I, I put it in my password manager. I used to put it in a password protected Word file, but, you know, don't put in the real answers. It's ju ju just, just, crazy, crazy, crazy to put in the real answers, put in gobbledygook, treat them like a password, something like that. Uh, some people, a lot of the systems today allow you to do an SMS recovery, you know, where, hey, it'll send you a code to your phone or your phone number. In order to do this, a hacker must know your email address or phone number. Uh, but they can, you know, a hacker can pretend to be anybody like, hey, if they know that you have a Gmail account, they can say, We're, they can send you a text message. Uh, you don't know what the phone number, whether that's Google or not. Go, hey, I'm from Google Security. We've detected a rogue sign in to your account in order to determine a legitimate login, we're gonna send you a verification code to your previously registered phone number from another Google support number. Please retype the sent verification code in response to this message or your account will be permanently blocked. You wanna scare them by telling them that their account's gonna be locked out if they don't respond. Then the hacker simply, in this case, goes to Google, tells Google they forgot your password. They don't know your password. Google's nice as, hey, you wanna try your last password? Say no, try another way. Google will then give the hacker four different ways to recover the account, one of which is SMS, where it will send a code to the victim's phone. The victim gets that code, and if they type it back in response to that message, it is game over. And let me say, we could do this game all day long. I could send you a text message saying, hey, uh, we're from your water treatment plant, and there's been a water main break in your area that's being repaired. Please do not drink the water. Would you like to be proactively notified when the water main break is restored? Yes or no? And you respond, well, yes. Okay, we're gonna send you a verification code. You need to tell us what this code is and we'll put you on our notification list, right? I mean, who's not gonna respond and say yes? And then what they're doing is really in reality, resetting your email account or your bank account or something like that. You get this reset code. You don't, you know, you've been told to expect it. You get the code, you type it in game over. And the question is, you just don't know uh, who's calling you or who's texting you, who they really are. So be aware of these rogue recovery messages. Recognize when you're given a pen, typically you're typing that into a browser, not back into SMS message. If they send it to you in an SMS message, it's always almost never typed back into SMS. Uh, try to use non-fishable MFA whenever possible. And if you don't know what non-fishable MFA means, go to my LinkedIn account, follow Roger Grimes, Roger A. Grimes on LinkedIn, and I talk about it frequently. Uh, try to avoid SMS-based recovery methods when you can. Unfortunately, you're going to have a hard time uh, avoiding it. So, uh, And I even try, of course, to minimize the public posting of my phone number, uh, even though hackers can use it other ways, so that way they can't do these sort of tricks with you. Uh, so uh, here's another type of attack called a homography attack, a homoglyph attack, homoglyphic attack, homo homography attack. Um, essentially, what it comes down to is that some of the letters that you see in a browser or a URL link, uh, those letters may look like a particular letter, but they can actually be other letters in other languages. Uh, and this is called, a, again, a homoglyph attack. 
uh, or maybe homographic or even Puni code. And we'll talk about why that is. But just know in every computer, there is a defined set, a character set defining what characters and languages that can be used to display and print characters on your screen and emails and on the web and stuff like that. Early on, uh, the first computers uh, used what's called the ASCII, the American Standard Change of Information Interchange uh, character set. It only had 128 characters. So it was like uppercase, lowercase English letters, plus some numbers and other symbols on your keyboard, plus the first 30 or so were kind of like these control characters used for formatting text on the screen or printing. But it, you know, it couldn't support Cyrillic or Chinese or something like that. It really only did English and barely did a great job of that. So starting with um, Microsoft Windows 2000, Microsoft switched from uh, ASCII and another thing called ANSI uh, to something called Unicode. And Unicode uh, has thousands and thousands of characters and it. it supports every known language active and ancient. Uh, which I, I love. I was like, ancient? Yep, turns out like they even support uh, uh, languages that have disappeared that are known like Egyptian, hieroglyphics and things like that. So Windows supports uh, these millions and millions of different characters for different languages. Although for the web, the web decided we they can't, they, they can only use eight bits to represent particular characters. And so it's the, they took a subset of the Unicode characters that fit in what's called eight bits. And they made, uh, it's called Uni, Unicode transformation format eight bit, or what really got came, got, came to be known as Puni Punny code. Uh, but when you type a character into your browser, it really gets converted to the ASCII ANSI character behind the scenes. So you think you typed in an A and it was an A, but it actually gets converted to like a number, a, a, a hexadecimal number. And that's the way that it's really transmitted and determined what's going to be. And unfortunately, some characters look like other characters in other languages. And this was first taught to us in 2017 when someone announced this attack for the first time and showed that people were clicking on a link that looked like Apple, even with the locked icon, meaning SSL was enabled or TLS was enabled. Uh, but it really wasn't an A for Apple. It really was a Cyrillic A that looked like Apple. And when you clicked on it, it really took you to this other Chinese website, right? Uh, so they're just trying to show what you see and where you go could be two different things. So the problem, again, was the Unicode Latin A, that's the English A, that's hexadecimal 61 behind the scenes. And the Cyrillic A, which looks exactly identical, is a completely different hexadecimal character. So it allows fishers to create domain names that look like other domain names but really are different uh and they you know from 2017 to like 2020 it was more of a theoretical attack uh, hey be careful about and i talked about it a lot but in 2021 microsoft and other companies have been finding where they're using these hieroglyphic tricks uh you know like microsoft found 18 fake domains uh that were used in real world attacks uh, sometimes if the uh, browser manufacturers can detect this, they have to be kind of hard coded in the browser for each one. But, you know, like in the case of the Apple one, if you went to the fake Apple, it's hard coded in most browsers. Hey, you know, be careful. It looks like you meant to go to apple.com, but the site you visited looks fake. Attackers sometimes mimic sites by making small, hard to see changes in the URL. Of course. So you can click there and go to the real Apple if you want. But there's been some other tricks like, Turns out one of the control characters in Unicode allows uh, somebody to flip the direction of the character. So there is this right to left override RLO uh, non-printing Unicode character that after it, it is printed, it flips whatever is after it from left to right, to, to, you know, from right to left to left to right and vice versa. And attackers have been making what look like harmless file attachments. Uh, so like the document would look like document exe dot text, so, you know, ending in txt, you would think, oh, that's a text file or the other one document exe. Hey, it's just a PDF or something like that or cat picture exe dot gift. Well, that's you would think that, you know, that it's a text file or a PDF file or a GIF file. But that little space there is actually that unprintable right to left override code. And when you click on it, it actually converts it, uh, the two extensions there and the EXE. So you actually end up executing an executable file. And this was used in a particular type of attack just noticed this year. Uh, so these, you know, homographic, homoglyphic, puny code, punny code attacks, 
they're real. They're not super popular, but they are there. Uh, and here's another one where someone, here's another attack again, that um, where somebody, you get this email saying, oh, there's a voicemail and they make it look like it's an MT, an MP3, you know, uh, audio file. But if you look, it's got the little space in it. So really what it ends up being is that it's HTML. HTML at the use. It looks like MTH, but really it's HTML. So it flips that bit when you click on it. And now you're running on a web server web page. And they're like, oh, usually they're going to play you the a fake audio file and go, hey, would you like to contact them? And you click the button. They're trying to get you, you know, to do even more. Uh, okay, the last attack with our last 15 minutes to go here. The last five minutes to go is called bad rules and forms. This is kind of an, it's not an uncommon attack. It's not common. It's not uncommon. They've been around for decades and you can do some damage here, but just know that most email clients, the, the sophisticated email clients, uh, Outlook and Gmail and Apple Mail and Thunderbird and et cetera, they allow the user or admins to customize the experience of using that email program. And they're meant to do things like, hey, if an email is coming from my boss, you know, highlight it. Uh, if an email is coming in from my mom, put it in a special folder. But they allow you to kind of create these rules and forms to customize your experience. Forms being like you could send a special form. They like a lot of people know it as stationary. We get this really pretty background or something. Uh, so they've been around forever, and hackers have been abusing this forever. And what they'll do is if, if they have your email address and password, or if they're on your workstation. Uh, they can modify your email rules. They can put in new rules, modify existing rules, put in new forms, modify existing forms to put in malicious commands. And then they can trigger those commands. Like they can literally create a rule or a form that says, if this email contains the word frog, frog, then kick off and format their machine or create you know, a remote tunnel so I can get on in. I have people that will call me a couple of times a year and say, hey, we've had this attacker break in. We don't know how they're getting in. Uh, but and we've done everything. We've even got new laptops and we've changed our passwords. How are they getting in? And I'll say go check for a rogue ruler form because many times that's how they're getting in. And then these days, like with Office 365, it can simply be that you clicked on an email that said, oh, I need to have these rules, you know, and we need to have these permissions. So like OAuth, open authorization attacks, um, you'll get this email that claims that it's from Microsoft. Oh, I need to have permissions. Oh, what's called OAuth permission. You say yes. And what they do is you just gave them access to your email rules and forms in Office 365, and it's all automated and they create a fake form or create a fake rule. Uh, but what, what's changed lately is that there's a lot of remote hacking tools where if the attacker has just your email address and password, let's assume they did that first attack I showed you and got your password hashed and converted it to your password. Now they have your login name and password. They can remotely install one of these rogue rules. And this really became, it's been, you've been able to do it for decades, but about 10 years ago, there was a hacker tool called Empire PowerShell that is still used, one of the most common hacker tools used today. It's kind of going out of favor lately. But that Empire PowerShell, which you can go to PowerShellEmpire.com and download it right now, uh, it has 285 hacker modules, uh, part of which, if you look at the very top there, there's a rule that allows me to install an Apple script stager. So when a trigger word's present in an email and the subject of the incoming email it will trigger this, you know, hacker rule. And all you have to know is the login name and password. Typically, if you're on a client like an Outlook here, let's say if I go file properties, rules, alerts, uh, if I look for a rule, most people don't have any rules to start with, but you can literally go, I want a new rule. And then you have all these options like I want this rule to apply in messages I receive. And this example here, let's send every email I get to another person. You know, we're going to forward all incoming emails to this other person. Attackers many times will do that uh, to eavesdrop on your email. So you don't even know what's happening. But every time you get an email, that email because of this rule is forwarding a copy of that email to them. Uh, and, uh, and by the way, in Gmail, they call them filters and different, they call them different things, uh, rules, filters, stationaries, whatever it might be. And they can literally do anything uh, once it's triggering that form that the scripting language allows. They can format your hard drive. They can change banking details. They can give the attack a remote back door. They can run a script. They can start an application, which could even be a bogus application. But what people don't know is that your rules and forms can be modified by the attacker remotely. Uh, like for an example here, I'm going to go modify a form. You have to add the developer tab to your quick access toolbar 
to see your forms. But if you do add the developer tab and Outlook, you can see the design of form and it will show you here's the built in forms that are in Outlook. Uh, the message one is used to display any any incoming uh, mail if it doesn't have another form name. But an attacker can modify it, actually inject code into that form, like in this case, uh, this pseudo code I created saying run Netcat. Uh, that's a really popular uh, hacker tool, Swiss Army knife of the hacker world saying run Netcat, connect back to my rogue server on the internet over port 443 because that's always allowed out through the firewall and then D-E execute command com. This if run would give the hacker at, rem at rogueserver.com a remote access shell, allow them to get into the machine and the hacker could create that form David, let's say in this case, standard inbox form, then all the attacker would have to do is send an email from their system using the same name, standard inbox form. The email wouldn't look any different than any email you've ever seen. You would, All you'd have to do is open the email and boom, if it has the same name behind the scenes, it would trigger the form that they installed remotely. So that, that again is what, what's different here is that attackers remotely can install rogue rules and forms that then allow them to control your PC. Um, Empire PowerShell does it. There's lots of tools that do it. There's another one uh, written by kind of a white hat hacker uh, company called SensePost. They made one called Ruler. Now you can download it off of GitHub that allows you to remotely create custom forms. All you have to know is the person's email address and password, and you say dash add a form and then send a form that triggers that form. Uh, I'm gonna show you a demo here, but uh, SensePost made some really great, de really great demos, uh, and here's one out of many. But again, what they're gonna do is have the, use the victim, the pretend victim's email address and password, and they're gonna use the ruler hacking tool to create a rogue form and then trigger it to give them what's called a remote, uh, a remote shell into the victim's machine. They're actually gonna send the Empire PowerShell. Remember, that's that hacker tool that had 285 different commands on it. They're gonna send an encrypted version or an obfuscated version of, Imp of Empire PowerShell to the victim's machine and then trigger it with a rogue form and then send back to themselves a remote access backdoor into their system. And all they had was the user's email address and password. This is a really cool video to watch later on to watch and it, it goes pretty quick. Uh, I'm going to cover it, but it's over in about a minute or two. It goes down quick at the top. They have an Empire, or they have a SensePost ruler tool. They're checking the version number. Uh, now, this is the victim client and Outlook. They're showing you that they don't have any rules or forms right now. It's all blank. On the right side of the screen, they have Process Explorer by Microsoft showing you what's running. Uh, and at the first, the first ruler tool that they run at the top, they're showing you the email address of the person, and the form is going to be called Display. They're just checking to see that using the password they put in, they could connect to that email client. At the bottom, it's Empire PowerShell listening agent. They're showing you there's no agents yet. At the top, they're going to have Empire PowerShell reverse shell. They're going to obfuscate it so it can't be found by antivirus. And now they're going to kick off their attack. So they're connecting to the email victim, adding a form called demo, and they're including in that form the Empire PowerShell reverse shell. Here it is. The tool's now connecting to that Outlook client. It's creating that malicious form, and then it's going to kick off that form by sending an email that when the email is opened or looked at, kicks off the Empire reverse shell. So now they're going to the client. You'll see the email arrive. And again, on the right side of the screen, it's uh, it's Process Explorer, Sys Internals Process Explorer. You'll see a command shell. There's the fake email, and boom. Now see that conhost.exe? That's a PowerShell, Empire PowerShell reverse shell opening up a listening agent to the hacker's computer. So again, all they did was, and now they're on that victim's computer with complete control of that system. All they did was have the email address and password kick off the SensePost ruler tool to inject a malicious form and activate it so it opened up a reverse uh, um, Empire reverse command com shell back to the hacker's server. Pretty wild, huh? So uh, what's amazing, you know, is that the, all the rogue rules and forms are pretty much not caught by any antivirus program. It's even really hard to find any event logging for it. Really, your only defense, use MFA, at least to prevent, you know, that, that they can't log into the account remotely without multi-factor authentication 
or if you have login name and password, use check for you should check for rogue rules and forms like every six months to a year at the very least. Microsoft actually gives you a PowerShell script for Office 365 clients called Get All Tenant Rules and Forms. Uh, SensePost Ruler made a tool called Not Ruler that checks for rogue rules and forms on on-premises Microsoft Exchange servers. Uh, I don't know of any uh, checking tools for Gmail or Thunderbird or something, but I bet someone could make a script. Uh, but, you know, that's the idea is that you have to sometimes look for this stuff. I tell people, if your company's been hacked, or your device has been hacked, you should check for one of these rogue rules or forms. And the key takeaway from this, just know email, of course, we know has been a, you know, long been a common attack vector. Regular phishing, the regular stuff where they try to get you to click a link or download a file, that's responsible for most hacking today. But there are some advanced methods like I've shown you today that a lot of people don't know about, and some of them aren't detected by the firewall stuff or by antivirus. Uh, just train yourself and your employees to be aware about the different types of ways. You know, yes, clicking on a link alone could cause a problem. Uh, with that said, thanks. For, if you want to know if your passwords are out there on the internet, you can run No Before's Password Exposure Test Tool that will look for passwords and password weaknesses for all your employees all at once. But if we got a couple of minutes left, maybe we can take some questions. If we don't get to your questions today, uh, feel free to email me at rogerg at knowbefore.com, and you can follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter. With that, David, did we get any questions? Absolutely. Yeah, we got a ton of questions coming in. Just a few minutes to to cover a few of those. Uh, go ahead and take a breath, take a drink of water, Roger. Uh, fantastic presentation. Um, someone out there in the audience said their mind is always blown at least once every time you present. And I know my my mind was blown when you talked about the the hair or the little line that's on a touch screen tricking someone into tapping on that. I was like, wow, that is incredible. Uh, but so many incredible things in the presentation. Um, let's see. First question I see here for you, they're asking, you know, why isn't a long and complex password enough anymore? Well, you know, it, it, it can, but if you have a 12 character, truly complex, truly, truly random password, it stops every known password guessing cracking attack. But most people's passwords aren't truly random and they're not as hard to guess as you think. Got it. Okay. And then let's see, Michael's asking, uh, does two factor authentication stop this kind of stuff? Yeah. I mean, it stops, it stops a lot of them, you know, there, although 95% of MFA can be hacked around with a regular phishing email. If you don't know what I mean, go to LinkedIn, look for one of my articles. I talk about it all the time. Most MFA, 90, 95% of it can be bypassed with a simple phishing email. If I can trick you to clicking on the link, it's game over for MFA people as well. Wow. Um, another question here, Bradford's asking, can passwordless fix this? <laughs> uh, yes and no. I mean, I mean, again, passwordless, a lot of times, most of the passwordless options are pretty easy to fish around and hack around, but yeah, they, they can help. I mean, you know, again, if the attack requires that you, you know, use a login name and password that can, you know, stop password attacks, can, passwordless authentication can stop those sort of attacks, but other attacks get around those. I mean, so it really kind of depends, but for the attacks that I covered today, long and complex passwords, truly random passwords and password auth authentication stops most of these attacks. Got it. Okay. Uh, Victor's asking if you have any recommendation for some of the most common phishing uh, attacks to be aware of. Yeah. I mean, so the most common one is that, you know, Hey, click on this link or download this document. If you click on the link, it's going to take you somewhere and try to get you to download a, a Trojan horse. They're either going to usually try to get you to provide your login name and password or to execute content that can hurt you. Those that's, you know, that's 90% of your problem. The stuff I showed you today is less common than them just trying to trick you into giving away your password or to executing malicious content that puts a Trojan horse program on your machine. Got it. Uh, Chris is asking if you have any advice on how to get people to remember their security awareness training after the initial onboarding. Well, I mean, do it. You should do doing training and simulated phishing at least once a month. If you're not doing it once a month, uh, like most companies, I think only do it once a year. That's the same as almost not doing it. But if you're doing training and simulated phishing testing at least once a month, that helps drive home. We know our customers that do that are far harder to fish than the customers that don't do that. Absolutely. Yeah, I just finished my monthly know before security awareness training this morning. Uh, great stuff. Just took 15 minutes. So yeah, I encourage everyone to keep doing that each month. 
Um, Roger, I'm afraid we've run out of time here in our hour long webinar event. Uh, Roger has graciously put his email address there on the screen. If we uh, had a question we didn't have time for, you want to reach out to him directly. Uh, Roger, it's always a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks, everybody, for listening to me. And thank you to Know Before for supporting today's event. Uh, don't forget about the handouts tab there. There's a link to get started, getting started with Know Before. They've got tons of really excellent resources out there on their website. Make sure that you check that out, knowbefore.com. Uh, reach out to Roger there. His email address is on the screen again. Uh, Twitter and LinkedIn is also available there for additional information. Thank you to everyone who provided us uh, so many excellent questions. We got to as many of them as we could. We appreciate that. Before we go, I do want to announce the winner of our Amazon $300 gift card. This is going out to Diane Shelton from Pennsylvania. Congratulations, Diane Shelton from Pennsylvania. I hope everyone learned a lot on this event. I, I learned so much. Um, make sure that you uh, follow, you know, practice what you learned here today. Do whatever you can to better secure your IT organization and your company's data. I hope that you have a great day and we'll see you on our next event here at Actual Tech Media. Take care. Bye-bye.